Were you, were your friends the, um, there was a couple, there was a couple here that I spoke with, were they your friends or was it other people who you? No, I actually came through the Facebook group. Oh, okay. The other Facebook group. <laughs> I'm checking Stephen. Stephen. I'm checking Ryan's Facebook group. Stephen. 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 Are you, are you a, a resident here? For a couple of months and then I moved home. Where's home? Sydney. Oh, okay. Reading, reading on it or, or oh, on the the blurb, you mean? Yeah. Your name again? I'm sorry. Joe. Joe. Hi. 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 Did, have I? Have, were you in one of the? Yes, I was. I think in the weekend thing I did. That's right. Uh huh. Great. Shall we sit for maybe a minute? So it's a nice small group, and I would maybe we could have a roundtable discussion on the topic. Mm -hmm. um, I spoke about this a couple times, and I think one of the talks are online. Um, so maybe we can start with um, if, you, if each person can say what is of interest to them around addiction. And um, kind of curious what brings people here. So we have a, a nun in uh, Australia who's, who's writing about addiction and also um, runs workshops. And What's so her name? Uh, Tenzin Cherney. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Can yeah. I ask her, did she do a presentation? She might have. She was at Land and Medicine Buddha, I think, earlier this year. So she might have done something here. So she, yeah, she's writing on that at the moment. But just for some years, there's mm -hmm. been a sort of lot of interest and, and there's times people have said, you know, at times, could we have something more on addiction and so forth, so sort of quite interested Great. Um, in that, from that point of view. Wonderful. Um, what actually brought me to Buddhism, brought, brought me to Buddhism in the first place was um, 
uh, Kevin Griffin and his book One Breath at a Time. Mm-hmm. Um, it just seems so sensible to to marry uh, and show the different the uh, the similarities between Buddhism and the Twelve Steps, and um, and it really got me hooked and uh, made me want to uh, to study it further. And uh, <coughs> I was telling Venerable Chick before we began that uh, it was actually precipitated my my move to uh, San Francisco was to to delve further into my Buddhist studies from uh, from New York. Oh, nice. Welcome. How long have you been here? Uh, six months. Oh, wow. Nine. <laughs> Whenever April <laughs> was. <laughs> Welcome. Um, and I wanted to come to this presentation because I always think of addiction as attachment, of course. So I want to explore that a little more. Um, and I did come to that presentation you made, and I found it very useful. And I found um, the handout that you gave us was very useful too. And I've actually gone back and reread it Good. a few times, and you know, give it, g- given it more thought. And it's been helpful. It's pretty deep. It has layers to it. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'll talk a little about the text that she's mentioning. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. I found it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I actually, um, it's a, it, the, the text that's being referenced is a um, 19th century text written by um, a Nyingma master, Jigme Tempa Nima. He was a renowned scholar mm-hmm. known for his amazing um, lectures on the Bodhicara Avatara at, at the age of eight. <laughs> to assemblies of a thousand people, okay. yeah, <laughs> and uh, he was a um, an incarnate of the Dodrupchen lineage, of which is uh, one of the l- Toku lines of the Nyingma. You probably a lot of this might be, um, and so he spent uh, most of his life in solitary retreat. Um, So he didn't actually write. It was interesting because he was a scholar, and he wrote. I mean, he, he was he w- he had the ability to have you know mastery over these amazing texts as a child, um, but him he himself did not write very much. And so, one of the things he did write, he wrote a, a couple a major commentaries on the Guru Garbha Tantra, and they were very co- very big, large texts. Mm-hmm. And then he wrote a third text, and that third text it was a really essentialized pith instruction on transforming suffering into happiness. Mm-hmm. And that was the text that I mm-hmm. presented. It's maybe, what was it, 15, 16 pages in the, even yeah, less. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it, was, it, was, it was maybe 10. It's, it's, not, it's not very much, but it, it essentializes uh, from his point of view, the entire um, the main points of the Bodhicara Avatara and how to transform suffering. So I'd like to actually talk about that text again sometime. That'd be a great um, thing to revisit, that text. And maybe we can reference it tonight <coughs> a little bit. So the uh, topic tonight of addiction, I actually um, got interested in this topic because I was interested in college uh, in mind and what allows some people to change and what prevents some people. They want to change, but they find themselves repeating the past ha- uh, habits and patterns. Um, uh, so I went from philosophy, which is what I was studying, to psychology, and that's why I uh, practice now. I'm a psychologist. Um, and I was... Uh, really interested in the topic of addiction uh, because among all the uh, mental disturbances like depression, anxiety, it happened to be the only one that I knew of for which there absolutely was not um, treatment, a a, uh, drug treatment, you know, pharmacological treatment. Um, Whereas in depression and anxiety, there's a protocol for being able to target very specifically the... um, neurotransmitters involved 
and then there are antidepressants and even in cases of very severe mental disturbances like schizophrenia, we have medications. So it's fascinating that we can actually um, target and have this sort of treatment plan that's pharmacological and really much relates to the whole organism as a biological entity. And at the time, I was really interested in beyond the bio biology. Consciousness is a non-biological process. So, um, and there's the debates about that, and I was really interested in those debates. So addiction happened to be really fascinating because we really didn't have a treatment protocol, and we still don't. That, that can relate to the situation as a sheer biological uh, model. Um, and the topic in, in philosophy is called second order desires. It means the desire to have a desire. So if you're wanting to quit smoking, the desire to not desire cigarettes is regarded as a second order desire. So I was really, that was specifically what I was interested in. Um, we can have a desire around something and um, we, some people are able to follow through with their aspiration, follow through with their desire to stop smoking and succeed, and so many people can't. So I was interested, what's, what is there, what's the difference there? Both want to, you know, both people want to stop smoking or whatever it might be, you know, but there's a really different, we see really differences in how that happens. So, um, the basic uh, field of addiction, as it stands, is uh, relates to the um, the issue of dependence and abuse, as um, bio what they call biopsychosocial. So it has components of they regard biology and the situation around what happened to us, the experiences of early childhood, psychology, and then the social environment. So uh, with, if we begin with sort of the notion of um, addiction, uh, you know, beyond the idea of, of second order desires, the desire to want to do something, it may not be an addiction. An addiction has a component to it where the individual's repertoire gets narrow. Their experience of day-to-day -day activities falls by the wayside. There is a um, component to addiction that's compulsive, where the person is um, beyond, beyond a situation of engaging it uh, on a level of, of a one-time thing or a, maybe a w weekly thing. Uh, that's an abuse. We call that substance abuse. So we distinguish abuse from it from dependence, uh, or you know the word addiction is loaded. So I'm kind of parsing clinically what we relate to it as. Um, and then the the real distinction between dependence, which is more severe, and abuse is dependence is characterized by tolerance, withdrawal, and a uh, um, pervasive. It, it pervades the person's life. Um, but the interesting thing about the, the phenomenon is that it's a the basis of addiction. We can we can kind of relate fundamentally to all of our issues of desire attachment. Um, and how we relate to ourselves. When we look at someone who, is, who has a full-blown addiction, the, um, the most, one of the most common characteristics in the personality is a split in the personality. So um, what I'm going to talk about is just a little bit about what we understand psychologically about addiction uh, and, how can that, and how can that be related to spirituality. The example that I usually 
give that my professor gave in graduate school, which I think is a great one, is uh, considering a four or five-year-old child who, let's, for the sake of argument, say their mom uh, comes home around 10, 10.30 every night after being out, friends and dating and whatever, and brings home like a lollipop. And so the child, um, these are, this is a very extreme example to illustrate the point. The child grows up remembering their mother as being really wonderful because whenever she came home, she would bring a lollipop. That illustrates that the basic um, fundamental need for the child is to maintain some sort of form of contact, that, that the child is willing to brush um, under the, the, the rug their needs and is willing to distort their experience of what's happening. You know, they're not being put to bed on time. They're not being fed at an appropriate time. They're not being cared for. But, that ex but, but, it's, but if that, they're in touch with that, if they, if they really get in touch with how they're being neglected, that's going to undermine their investment to have a contact with the caretaker. So the investment of being connected trumps um, uh, what, they, what might be what, what they might feel is, is more beneficial for them, you know, the idea of being fed, the idea of being put to sleep on time. They distort their experiences. And so an addict, uh, typically the profile of someone with dependence issues in particular, beyond abuse, because it's more common to have, you know, one too many and get a DUI. Not maybe a DUI, but to have one too many and to get sick or to, that can happen to a lot of people. But dependence actually is more rare. It shows a more consistency in the way the person's relating to being altered, to, 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 the, to the use of the drug. So when we see the profile of someone with a dependence issue, we see someone typically who has developed a very uh, good ability to, not, to deny their needs, to not really be in touch with their needs. And so the, what ends up happening um, is that the child is vying for the mother or the caretaker's attention, is vying for approval, and they are, they are going to be um, ignoring maybe what they, what they would like in other, and, and, and they, they will err on the side of what the, what the caretaker would like. They'll err, err on the side of what, um, what would make you know, their mother or father happy because they want the approval, they want the contact. Okay. So then what happens is the personality splits. If, I'm, if it's severe enough, this, this dynamic, there's a split. And it doesn't have to be a situation where the child is neglected. It can be a situation where the child is living in a really affluent, opulent situation, but their parents are very judgmental. Their parents are constantly putting a very high expectation. And the f message is that my mom or my dad or my guardian is going to love me conditionally, that if I don't meet you know, these criterion, I'm not going to be loved, regardless of whether that might be true or not. That's the message that the child will get if there's a really severe, judgmental, critical environment or a neglectful environment. So then if that's, a, if that's prominent, then what happens is the personality splits in what we call a real self and an ideal self and then an impoverished self. So the, the real self is neglected. The real self is the one with the genuine desires and the authentic needs that's not being met. The child's not in touch with that. And instead, there's an ideal self of wanting to be Superman or Superwoman for mommy or daddy. And then that also creates a split in terms of an impoverished self. So if your mother is very judgmental, very critical, um, and then also can like, you know, in if there's a pendulum swing around the mother maybe putting the child on the pedestal and saying you're so wonderful and then cutting them down and saying I wish you were never born, that creates a real big dissonance psychically. The child feels either on top of the world, an over-idealization of their capacity, or they feel like completely crummy and they feel like dirt. Yeah, that's that would be like that would be a really extreme kind of uh, toxic situation around this. Uh, the basic point is that there's a message around conditional conditional love. There's a message around um, uh, there's there's often an inconsistent 
c connection. So the so the inconsistency is there, where the mother might, you know, really smother the child and then suddenly be gone, or the mother might be very overbearing and constantly critical, um, giving the child this mixed message around love on the one hand, but at a price on the other. Was this making sense? So. Yeah, that's the cost. So that's that's a mixed message. So if I'm the mom and I'm smothering you, and then I'm suddenly absent. So not all not all parents are neglectful. Some parents are overbearing. You know, some parents are fine. You know, one of the, there's, a, there's a saying by Winnicott that we just need good enough parenting. There's an, there doesn't have to be this, you know, perfect situation. But if there's not that good enough parenting, what the if that's not met, what that usually looks like is either overbearing judgmental, high, high expectations, or neglectful, you know, uh, very inconsistent in, in the quality of care and love. So we get this split in the personality between the ideal and then the impoverished. And in between, in that no man's land is a real self that's not being given any juice, that's not being given any spotlight or attention. So the experience that then happens is the child themselves experiences themselves as either on top of the world or completely like low self-worth and worthless. And they go back and forth, this, this pendulum swing. So that's a very typical profile of someone with a drug dependence. Traditionally, it's, re it's regarded as a narcissistic situation because um, not being in touch with your genuine real needs, what ends up happening is you are going to mirror and try to, and try to basically mold whatever the others might want you to be like or, or, not, or, or kind of proceed with this idea of what you think you should be like as opposed to what you really are like proceed with the idea of um, credentials being the main motivating factor, for example, and putting so much energy and time and maybe establishing yourself as a um, you know, highly successful businessman when, when really that may not have been your genuine desires and needs, but you're looking at the, for this sort of outer criterion to measure up to. Um, so the phenomenon of addiction is actually a, a rampant modern phenomenon. In England, in the turn of the century, there was heroin prescribed for medical purposes, um, and there was much less addiction. So the actual substance obviously is important. You know, yes, nicotine, heroin, these are addictive properties, but the real foundation of addiction is uh, its root has to do with the sense of self. Um, now I'm coming from the point of view of psychology. If you have maybe a neurobiologist, they would say something different. But my understanding of addiction really is that it has to do with a sense of self. And, um, and so the experience of oneself uh, as uh, empty, feelings of emptiness, feelings of loneliness that are very, um, very deep, because there's an experience that the others does the other the others don't see me the others don't really know who I am and I don't know who I am deep alienation yeah yeah that's right a deep a deep sense of alienation and because there's a there's a lack of cultivation in what would otherwise be considered a genuine passion. The, ch the child, for example, let's say you have a child who is, loves music and wants to be a musician, but is very much, that, that desire is very much undermined and suppressed by their caretaker. Well, it's, it's quite possible they'll actually grow up without having um, connected in a, in a real way with that desire. And it may not even become, be a conscious at some point that they've suppressed it to the point where they're not even conscious that this was really something I love to do and I'm not doing it anymore. Um, Mm 
Mm-hmm. What do you mean? You mean subject yeah. object? Yeah, exactly. I I think that it's a good talk, good thing you're bringing up because uh, Buddhist. Um, philosophy it's uh um it has these terms like ego um self and it's imp i think it's important to really get a sense of what's going what are we talking about in psychology the term ego is a good thing it it, it has to do with a put together structure of the psyche where you're not experiencing um uh, your where your consciousness is not basically um, dissipated in, in, in many ways. Uh, uh, one of the fundamental pieces around that is something called object constancy. So if I, let's say, uh, hit it off with you, and I've just met you, and then um, a few days pass, and then I, if I don't have very good object constancy, I'm not going to be able to really bring up that experience with you. It'll be like whatever is in front of me is what's what I'm really going to engage in, and I'm not going to really. And it'll be more difficult for me to invest in relationships in general because I lack the ability to really connect to the experience of connection. Isn't that in San Francisco? Excuse me. Isn't that San Francisco? It's a urban. It's not New York City. <laughs> Maybe the flaky California. But the point is, but the point of object constancy is something like the word ego in psychology, ego strength. It's it's it has to do with uh, many things that are actually positive. Right. So um, the subject object duality, uh, that that you're starting to get into the field of met Buddhist metaphysics, which may not be as relevant. Well, ultimately, it is relevant, but right now, what I'm talking about is actually on a much more gross level. Um, Um, the very common thing, for example, is the sense of self versus self-grasping. Uh, when a lot of times we talk about ego in Buddhism, it can become synonymous with what we would normally consider the sense of self. Um, whereas self-grasping is, um, I'm sorry, the, when we talk about ego, we're talking about self-grasping, not the sense of self. Because if we don't have the sense of self, then we're psychotic. We don't know that we're in this room. So when we talk about ego in Buddhism, what we're normally talking about is self-grasping, that the suffering that ensues from relating to the situation from a, um, from a really distorted place, okay? Um, and and so, the, so the piece in the addiction is, is fascinating because there's this experience of, uh, uh, there's, there's this lack of a foundation of, of what we were of, of our real wants and our real needs so there is so so then the self grasping that that comes from that is uh, a basic intolerance around suffering because there's not a foundation that's able to um, and and we can talk about the human condition in and, and a lot of the harm we cause is being intolerance to basically handle our stuff you know, violence and, um, you know, major um, just, you know, breakdowns in communication and relationships have to do, again, with this intolerance of the distress that might come, come about, uh, not being able to handle loneliness, not being able to handle jealousy. Uh, the addiction situ process is extremely an isolated process, so it's not going to involve others. You're going to, it's a question of checking out and disconnecting when you, well, that allows for a not experience uh, not experiencing the alienation not experiencing the um, the loneliness um, not experiencing 
perceived feelings of failure, not experiencing um, feelings of lack. It's really what it, the, the, the idea that might be helpful here is it's a situation where for a period of time there's been a lack of cultivation of things that make our life full, of what makes our life feel meaningful. Uh, that could be talents that we didn't develop, that could be desires and, and pursuits. And this is an interesting issue because in Buddhism we talk, of, you know, it's very oftentimes those things can have a bad rap, you know, pursuing our, our passion, pursuing what, what makes us happy. Um, and it, it's, it's one of those kind of scenarios where almost before we are going to transcend there has to be something to transcend. Before we um, renunciate, there has to be that um, capacity to know what is it we're renunciating. So uh, uh, in, in philosophy, it's called the pre-trans fallacy, you know, that, that to kind of try to take, put the uh, cart before the horse, it's, you know, it, you're taking something that's pre-egoic, pre-developmental, and confusing it with a transcendental state of mind confusing like that non that non-dual let's say a uh, place of the womb as being an enlightened place mm -hmm. or as being a place that is like when we talk about going beyond subject object mm -hmm. it's called a pre-trans fallacy it's a it's a mistake to to think that they're mm -hmm. similar mm -hmm. you know they're completely two different balls of wax mm -hmm. and so similarly when we talk about addiction what we have is a situation where there's been a, the, the, the garden has not been cultivated. So there, there really is not the, um, it's not the same as, as not, you know, not engaging in the fruit because there had, there is no fruit. There really has not been a cultivation of genuine desires and authentic connection with people uh, to, as a spectrum. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be talking in absolute terms, but by and large, the more of a s addiction, you have, the more of an addictive situation is going on, the less of a foundation there is in a meaningful, authentic life. Socially, occupationally, artistically, okay? And that's why one of the hallmark features that I said in the beginning of addiction is a narrowing of the repertoire of life, uh, where the, um, the beginning phases begin recreationally. Addiction begins recreationally, where we're, we're trying things out. Then it begins on a more um, uh, kind of uh, ritual level. Maybe Thanksgiving, Christmas, they, you know, we drink, or maybe Friday night after work we drink. It begins becoming a little bit more in our schedule. We, and then it begins developing a situation where it becomes a motivating factor, where we, st we won't even go to the party if there's not cocaine. Um, and then that motivating factor then uh, becomes, and that's an example of the narrowing of the repertoire, right? We're not going to the party to forge uh, old and new relationships, you know. So there's this, there's this, and so it becomes really obvious by the end that that the driving force has been um, uh, not not a genuine connection to life, okay. Um, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, uh, I'm not sure if, how many of you might be familiar with the name, he really talked about the three lords of materialism. And by materialism, he meant um, BSing ourselves. Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, Trungpa, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's Ch Pema Children's teacher. Yeah, so he talks about the the materialism, psychological materialism, uh, material materialism, and uh, spiritual materialism, and these are ways of bypassing our genuine, authentic experience. Psychological materialism being um, one in which we're, we we kind of uh, invest in a sort of self-help kind of program and then go to another self-help program and another self-help program and fundamentally just don't sit with our own stuff. But it's this sort of situation of 
going to that weekend and expecting to come back, you know, feeling like there's, you're going to be blissed out and your problems will be going away. And, and you can go to any bookstore and look at the pop psychology books. You know, it's a whole market for that. Uh, then there's the uh, piece around material materialism, and that's obviously when we're taking refuge in, you know, the Mercedes and the, the creden you know, the kind of the labels and our current economic crash can be also a s obvious symptom of that level of material materialism, the level at which people live are living live their lives on credit credit cards in order to have what their neighbors are having or have what their friends are having. So it, again, another way of bypassing the situation of of our reality of the you know if if you're experiencing a hang up a, a, you go shopping, you know. So that's material materialism. And then the most, uh, the one he focused most on and the one that's most subtle and difficult to catch is spiritual materialism. And spiritual materialism is using spiritual teachings as a way to bypass our own stuff. Uh, using um, spirituality as another credential of how great I am or how, you know, accomplished I am. Uh, it's, it's a... False. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the relating to the spiritual path as another way to try to bypass pain, bypass, as opposed to process suffering, bypass suffering. Um, if I go, you know, to the uh, to this empowerment, then I'll be able to um, get get this get this girlfriend or get this car or I'll do the mantra, you know, so many times and I'll. You know, it's a basic relationship to the spiritual teachings as a way to just continue pursuing what they, you know, what we call the eight worldly dharmas. Um, the, you know, the basic pursuit, um, narrow, just n narrow minded pursuit for our pleasure beyond other people's pleasure, our um, avoiding pain for ourselves, regardless of that causing pain for others, you know. Um, invested in, in our own fame, invested in our own gain, um, invested in, um, I forgot what I was in, <laughs> pleasure, and then fame, and then gain. I always forget the fourth one. You get the point, though. So... And, and, you know, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, he said something really beautiful in one of his books around if we look at animals and we look at humans, uh, they're, they're indistinguishable insofar as they, are, they both are engaged in the worldly dharmas of wanting to, you know, that the, that the big bird will feed it herself or himself, you know, first and will be more invested in that or the uh, um, basic pursuit of pleasure and avoiding of avoidance of pain as a as a sense of beyond uh, beyond the idea of others beyond the idea of of um what what would can be considered you know of more of a place of equanimity so so the, what distinguishes humans from animals really is humans have the ability to not engage in these eight worldly dharmas they're able to engage in a place of um uh just much more magnanimous action. And there's many figures in history that we can point to. Uh, they're able to engage with more wisdom and compassion. So the, the, so kind of going back to the, the addictive process, the, um, the, the drug is very powerful, or the behavior can be very powerful, because what happens then is relationships and um, fall by the wayside. And that's a further confirmation for the person in terms of their expectations. The expectancy of someone who grew up in a very conditional environment where deep down they felt they were not loved unconditionally and that they felt that, you know, mom or dad will leave me if I do this. You know, that A, my, if I, there's a sense of if my core is somehow unlovable and, um, at the root, I'll eventually be left if I don't measure up somehow. Well, in relationships, that can manifest as entering a relationship with the expectation that the other, if they really see who I am, will leave me. 
or will not be as interested in me. Um, entering relationships with an expectation that they um, that that this person isn't really connecting to me in in the way that they, they don't really see who I am. If they really saw me for who I am, then they wouldn't want to be with me. It's a it's a repeat of the experience they may have felt on a very subtle level in childhood of that conditional of that conditional push pull. Or it could be, happen the opposite way, where they feel um, that they want to that they don't feel like they can be in the relationship. Um, fully and they'd rather just check out of the relationship they'd rather you know not ex they'd rather just disconnect and be in that place of isolation um, so that's that's called expectancy and expectancy is very difficult to change so the drug confirms that expectancy the drug you know one of the famous things is uh, that's said about it is that the fallout is part of the payoff that the fallout of the drug you know that we think that what, what we want is to get high, but what happens then after we get high is the social fallout. The, you know, we lose our job a lot of times. Lots of carnage occurs from uh, being so checked out and so um, and out of control. You know? And so that confirms our expectancy around that low self-worth. So then let's say something let's say happens where our wife leaves us you know we've had we just can't handle the drinking and she leaves us or is going to threaten to leave us then that kicks in our desire for redemption so there's that again that early childhood dynamic of wanting to redeem oneself and then once we feel redeemed then there's a sabotage and so that because the sabotage allows for that cycle of acting in and acting out over and over again falling off the pedestal feeling like dirt and then creating the situation of I'm going to redeem myself and that becomes the dynamic of the relationship you know that the relationship doesn't really ever really leave the ground in a real way it's a yo-yo of acting in and acting out that can be in work as well you know um, coming unraveled at work you know not being able to perform getting a reprimand by our employer getting maybe a probation and then kind of that kicking us into motivating into into sort of um, you know stepping up and and then doing double time and, and kind of really um, uh, just basically um, it, there's a lack of moderation in the whole thing there's a lack of balance you know we're either going in one extreme or the other okay Is there any questions so far on any of this? Is it making sense? This dynamic, this psychological portrait? So, um, the, the, I, I we started late, so it's, if it's okay, I'll go a little bit over, maybe. It's been seven to eight, but. Is it to nine? Oh, okay, good. I got kind of... Okay. I thought for some reason last time I, it was an hour I did it. So I'll go to 09. Great. So um, the, I'll, you know, I could say, maybe I'll say one more thing in terms of the psychology and then I can talk about the spiritual piece of it. Um, the, um, so, the, so the general tendency is black and white thinking. The general tendency is either I'm great or I'm, I'm horrible. Uh, and the, 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 the filter of experience is, uh, does not really allow for a shade of gray. You know, Either I'm successful or I'm a failure. And then that creates the intolerance because when you're a failure, that really feels intolerable if that's what we're really experiencing. So, so that becomes a motivating factor for wanting to check out. Um, but one of the things that we found in terms of change in general is that change occurs in stages. And they talk about change, and the, the peop this, it's called the, the stages of change, developed by um, a psychologist whose father died of alcoholism. 
he was interested, why do some people change, why do others don't? Uh, the Clementi and Prochaska are the developers. And so in the stages of change, it always begins with not even knowing that you need to make a change. It's called pre-contemplation. Basically, it's not even on the radar that I need to change at first. Um, and then things occur usually from the outside. People maybe begin bringing up the fact that, you know, you're getting, you're blacking out every weekend or bringing up something along the lines of, you know, you're already in debt and you're, and you keep going shopping. Um, so it get, you start getting some signals from the outside, uh, that maybe I have a problem. Sometimes it can even come up from inside, you know, from within you might start but usually it's, it has to do with you start waking up to maybe I have a problem from the outside. People begin saying things. Your boss begins maybe getting on your case for coming to work late, you know, because you've had a hangover. And so that, that pre-contemplative stage um, bleeds into what's considered contemplation. So you begin contemplating. I wonder if I have a problem. Um, most addicts spend a long time in that stage of contemplation. That can be among the longest of the stages, of the five stages I'm going to talk about. The contemplation has been regarded by people with addiction issues as being among the most painful because in a way they themselves are no longer able to blissfully engage in their use, but they constantly have this background noise, you know, this is this may not be okay, and it, and sometimes it can be the background noise can be so loud that they can that that their whole being is able to resonate with how out of control and unhappy they are, and yet they continue with the with the behavior compulsively. Um, now, in the contemplation stage, there's basically a point at which the person comes to a conclusion around okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to only drink Friday nights. Or, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'll do cocaine one more time and I won't do it again. There's a conclusion around something, around the, the problem. Um, and then that's, and then once that conclusion has been made, that's the end of the contemplation stage. And they enter what's called the preparation stage. Now, this is actually something which we often overlook, but indeed when we have a really deep habit, it requires a level of prepare. Even when we have come to the conclusion about what to do, we often have to really prepare ourselves to do it. If you've come to the conclusion that you're going to stop drinking and you've been drinking for 20 years, it requires a, a, a degree of getting ready to do that, getting ready to no longer drink. Uh, it's like l the difference between saying goodbye to a lover for a few weeks versus burying your lover in the ground. It's, it's very intense, the idea of saying goodbye to something. And that stage can last up to a month. You can be actively using and actually come to the conclusion you're going to stop using and be in the preparation stage, and you can be getting ready to not use for weeks while using. Okay? But you're in the preparation stage because you've come to the conclusion you're going to stop using. Um, and you're just, get, you're just trying to get yourself ready to stop using. Then there's action stage. The action stage involves um, obviously enacting whatever conclusions we came to. And it's very rare for the action stage to endure. Oftentimes we find that we have to make adjustments. We, it's like going to a terrain we've never been to, going to a country we've never been to. There are going to be things that surprise us things that we weren't expecting. And so a lot of times there are situations around lapses and relapse. In, in addiction medicine, we distinguish a lapse as basically falling off the wagon for like a few days or a week. Uh, it's not that you've come to a different conclusion about your relationship with the drug. It's just that the situation was such that it, um, it was extremely difficult to resist and the urge overpowered your your you know your logical decision making, and you used. 
we distinguish that from a relapse because a relapse is when you have um, when you're no longer on board with the conclusion you made. So if you've made the conclusion I'm gonna uh, not drink anymore, and then you have a few slips, and then you just begin drinking, let's say on weekends again. Well, that's that's not a um, that's no longer that's no longer continuing with that conclusion. You've you've kind of gone back to the contemplative stage, made another conclusion. So there's a circle there, and so and a lot of times we have to go back to the prepar you know to the contemplation stage, preparation, action, figure out what we need to make adjustments in. Again, contemplation, preparation, action. And then once we've found something that works for us, where we're able to maintain it for a six-month period at least, then we are in what's called the maintenance stage. And the maintenance stage is maintaining that consistency. What all of this speaks to is that recovery from drugs and alcohol is not black and white. It is not a... It is not a clear-cut situation where the normal addictive mind thinks, you know, this is what I have to do. If I don't do it, I'm either six, you know, I'm a failure. The the actual process of change really involves many shades of gray, involves a work in progress, and it's it's uh, it's completely not compatible with the normal mindset of that black and white thinking. It's one of the reasons uh, it, it's such a struggle for people with addictions to recover because their normal habit is to relate to the situation as all or nothing. And it doesn't have to be abstinence. If I'm an addict, I could think, okay, I'm going to only drink on weekends. And if I don't, if I fail at doing that, it's going to feel like a complete failure. I'm going to uh, experience... Um, a, a lack of efficacy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to experience a lack of confidence overall. I won't see the situation as, well, you know, this was a slip or this, these were the factors that were involved. Um, so, the, um, so, that, so that piece puts us the psychology, that's the psychology of it. Um, the experience in recovery becomes like a garden. So you begin gardening your recovery. You begin cultivating relationships. You begin cultivating new things you do. You begin going to new places, and you begin developing a new life. It's a garden. And so when there's a lapse, when there's a situation like that, rather than throwing out the baby out with the bathwater, the experience would be, uh, one would be better served in relating to the situation as, okay, well, I didn't water my garden for a week. It doesn't mean that the garden is going to die. Uh, the training is again and again relating, de developing a different sense of self. It's really profound. It's very difficult because we're going from an experience of ourselves as um, this back and forth idealization and impoverishment to, you know, the good, bad, and the ugly. This is all me, and this is this is what I am. You know. Um, so in psych so in psychology what's re what's the treatment that really has been powerful among the treatments has been uh twelve step programs and the twelve step program begins with uh the idea of powerlessness um that I'm not at the helm not all treatment plans necessarily have to be in the twelve step was that not the first step or you're nodding your head no 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 Oh, the twelve-step program. Yeah, not not all treatment plans are twelve steps. We have also um, lots of relapse relapse prevention models that relate to the situation as um, a, a just reducing the amount of harm we're causing. So relapse relapse prevention harm reduction focuses more on reducing the harm and 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 looking at success as being a measure of reducing how much we're harming ourselves. Um, I'm curious to what's your um, disagreement with 12-step programs? Um, the the con concept of power powerlessness. Uh -huh. If you are powerless, I had a 
endless debate with several fellows. Um, if I'm powerless, that means that I can't, that I am powerless over picking up a substance and powerless over the duration and I am powerless over putting it down. Yeah. In other words, it will continue to, to, to rule my life. Um, that is in a, that is an acceptable bucket. I think that, um, that may be true for many people. Unfortunately, my my beef with twelve step is that it is sort of a um, it's a it's a catch all, <laughs> um, brilli brilliantly written, worked for millions of people. Unfortunately, that's also the guise that it's operated. Anytime there's dissidence, there's no there's no room for debate. Uh -huh. Well, this has worked for millions of people, so how can you possibly say that that you're any different? Then you must feel that you're terminally unique, so uh -huh. therefore you are wrong and you are bad, and therefore you are isolated. Um, and I don't buy it. That's interesting because a lot, most people I talk to who have an issue with the 12 steps has, it has more to do with their alienation with the notion of a theistic um, being, omnipotent theistic being. But the, the, first, but the powerlessness piece is fascinating because um, there's a, actually a, a, a line in that text that I mentioned that you brought up, um, turning suffering and happiness into enlightenment. And... Uh, one of the advices that Tempanima gives when you're suffering is to um, really allow that to be a, um, an aid and a guide to remember how we're at the mercy of our karma. And he says that when you suffer, one of the benefits of suffering is that it uh, ravages pride. And... Uh, he calls pride as the as the basic, um, I mean, literally as like the bad apple that rots the whole barrel. You, know, you can have all these amazing qualities, but pride is like this germ that rots it all. And he talks about suffering as a positive thing, in so far as it can, it can, if you relate to it uh, in this way, really undermine your uh, assumption that you are not at the mercy of your karma. It's kind of a powerful idea. If you relate to your suffering in this way. So if, if I'm suffering and I think about it, you know, rather than sort of get mired in the suffering, I can think about it as this is because of my karma and I didn't see this coming and I'm at the mercy of my karma. Um, please. So at the beginning of the year, um, <clears throat> um, Chodan Rinpoche was in Sydney and um, I'd just arrived back in Sydney and I was very ill <coughs> and ended up in hospital and feeling a little bit sorry for myself before it occurred to me to actually ring my <laughs> Geshe and say, what should I do? <laughs> <laughs> and so he checked out with Chodan Rinpoche and of course the first thing was to see the suffering as a blessing, you know, and it completely changed my mind to, to sort of regard it rather than, oh, I'm here missing out on something and, you know, you know, sort of looking at it from a very self-centered mm, point of view to actually saying, oh, right, because the, the message was like, this is a result of your karma and better to purify it in a human form than eons of hot hells and it certainly connects you with other people suffering immediately, especially if you're in hospital, you know, it's surrounded by it all the time. So it sort of really was very concrete transforming of that I mean, it wasn't about addiction, but it was about what the mind does with it and that how quickly you can turn that around. Yeah. It's amazing. The, uh, that shift, that shift that you mentioned is really, from, from my point of view, reflective of the whole situation. Uh, there was once a text that I had. I still have it. And it, in the text, it talks about... Um, the nature of ignorance as being a small but deep problem. Like uh, 
it's it's I I liken it like a situation around a spark plug. You know, if you if your spark plug isn't working, you don't have to overhaul the transmission. It's not it's not this sort of reinvention of this machine. It's a minor pro it's a minor repair. But if you don't repair it, you've got a big problem. You're not in, you're not going anywhere. So ignorance it's the it's this it's this sort of um, just this not seeing. You know, there's that there's the there's the the Buddha nature is there, and there's just just this not this layer of not seeing. And it's not that our core is confused, but just a little shift can make it the whole difference. Um, so that shift from you know. You, you have that experience of suffering and just relating to it from the point of view of karma. The difficulty is karma is difficult to see, very difficult to see. So it has to do, in that sense, um, you know, Nagarjuna said, if only our ribs would break the moment we stepped on a cockroach, all our problems would be solved <laughs> because there would be that immediate relationship, very easy to see. Oh, the powerlessness, uh, you mean with the 12-step program? or sorry. The relationship you mean with the first step or powerlessness, or I'm sorry? The no, I mean, my my thought at this point is that there is there is another way. You know, of what? Of, I don't, I'm not a proponent of, of total abstinence. I believe that there is, that, that there is a germ, that there, there is something that is, <coughs> that causes suffering and you don't have to eliminate anything that may be similar to it. Every, everything that may be similar to a particular substance in order for that um, for you to grow not, you not to not to drink the mouthwash and you know, stuff like that right and um, and I just think that I think that it gets conf it gets confused and it gets mired in in this in this grand concept of of twelve steps. I mean, I'm a big fan. Though, I think uh, in many in many ways of um, of the steps. I think it's the program that I have issues with, and, and it's the dogma of what works, what doesn't, and you see it in in, in, my, in my travels um, around the U.S. But um, and that's why I was looking for much more of a spiritual solution, which is which is the eleventh step. Um, I think through What's only the eleventh step is uh, <coughs> is sought through prayer and meditation, right? It's 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 a conscious contact with a with a with a god or higher power. Isn't there also the first the first few steps involve recognition of a higher power? Second is the, the possibility. Third is making the decision to, and that's probably the the. Almost, I guess, referencing the preparation stage, uh -huh. and then, making um, a decision to connect with the higher power, right. and then, um, and then you get all the way up to to the eleventh step, which is which is meaning to some sort of spiritual contact, um, in the hopes of resolving the, the all of your character defects um, that you addressed earlier earlier on between the the fourth and and all the way up to the ninth. I mean, what you're reminding me of is when the Buddha said, "Look here, my." Te regard yourself as sick, regard me as a physician, and regard my teachings as the medicine. Um, there's that similarity, isn't there, around recognition, the recognition piece. So the powerlessness could be recognize you are sick, right? Now I know in terms of, that's a loaded word, sick and powerlessness, right? Right. Well, in Zen Buddhism, my, the issue I had with, 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 what I've studied up to, what <coughs> the text I've studied out of Zen is, well, now that you know that you have the problem, don't do that anymore. Uh -huh. Once you've come to this realization, see, that's where the disconnect is between an addict and a normal person. Right. Because the addict can't. Okay, y yes, and, and as you were saying earlier, many times is, is quite aware of the issue and that's where the inability lies to to cease use of, of whatever whatever the substance is. Um, and I think that's that's right. I mean, once you see the problem, then stop. And that and why and why aren't we doing that? And so that has everything to do with with having the the experience of um, sympathy towards ourselves. 
sympathy towards our condition individually, like my situation. Um, having sympathy to, uh, around my suffering as opposed to judging my suffering. You know, the, the kind of, by now it's, I think, pretty well known, the famous sort of uh, inter interaction between His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and uh, Western teachers around this notion of self-esteem, where His Holiness was really at a loss in what, how, what that would be in Tibetan. There was not really a word for low self-esteem. Um, and I was actually listening to a teaching by Sogyal Rinpoche today where he said um, that the Buddha, he was quoting the Buddha along the lines of saying that the, the being, you know, among the, the, the being that first really deserves your love is yourself. That's like beginning there. That's the basis of, of caring for yourself and loving for yourself. But you see, the, that's, why, that's why I kind of took that time around the psychological portrait. Because the habit is not to love oneself. The habit is to judge oneself. Um, and then also just speaking a little bit about the piece around abstinence versus using sometimes. Uh, Twelve steps aside, the, the research um, that's been done on people who have met criterion for dependence um, is that about 5% manage to use moderately afterwards. After, after they've been, after they met criterion for dependence. So after you've sort of developed an addiction, then the research has shown that 95% cannot use moderately, which is not an, I'm not arguing for 12 steps. I mean, I didn't even know all the 12 steps, just so I'm not going for or against. But, I, but I, that research really was pointing to the biological piece That's my point. I mean, for instance, if you're addicted to cocaine, does that necessarily mean that um, that is necessary to give up wine? If wine was your precursor to cocaine, well, the, that's a different. I think that's a different a different story. But I think it has to do with how many degrees of separation there are. So, so clinically, what would you what would you say to that? Clinically, I would say that the real issue is dopamine and the off switch for dopamine. That when you've de when you've developed an addiction, whether it's eating overeating, sex addiction, gambling, or cocaine. What the common factor in all of that is a flood of dopamine in your brain. Okay, you're flooding your brain with dopamine, especially if it's a substance like cocaine, okay, or alcohol. You're you're really at that point taking a crowbar at your neurotransmitters and just opening that dopamine door. Or speed, yeah. So, what then happens is, normally, if I, let's say, have a piece of chocolate, I have some dopamine, and then my brain retrieves the dopamine. You know, there's an uptake. It's kind of like, because the, the, the brain's job is to maintain equilibrium. Now, if I'm doing something like gambling in Las Vegas for 12 hours straight, or doing, you know, cocaine or drinking, I'm forcing my brain to not be able to take that dopamine back. I'm breaking the off switch. Now, um, there's a certain point at which, like I, at, at which the off switch, when it, um, when it breaks, then it's broken. The dopamine floods the brain and we don't reuptake it like the, uh, in, in the way that we would, a, a normal person would. The phys there's a physiological shift that occurs, similar to diabetes. You, if, you, if you have a really bad diet with sugar, you can actually change your physiology with insulin and thereby develop diabetes. Even if you weren't born with it, you can develop diabetes. Okay? It does involve genetics. Okay? So, and genetics are involved in that off switch breaking. And... Um, and also the degree to which that off switch is broken. There are some people for whom the off switch is so broken that they can't have wine. Uh, you know, if they've developed, if they've kind of, for some people, the off switch may be broken, but not to the not to the point at which, you know, 
they can't, for example, have like maybe some some kind of something on Christmas or Thanksgiving, but it's Russian roulette too. In other words, think about it like Russian roulette. One person may have such a um, uh, 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 compromised brain chemistry situation where it's like Russian ru Russian roulette where you put in a um, out of four times or five times the gun will go off. Okay. Whereas someone whose brain may not be as compromised, it'll be like maybe 20 times, but then that gun will go off. The gun, the vulnerability for that gun going off is there once addiction's been developed. For some, it may be one out of 100 times. Others may be one out of five times. It really depends on the extent to which you, that brain chemistry has been compromised, the off switch has been broken. This is making sense? Mm -hmm. Get that switch back. Why do you want that switch back? Your your brain's at equilibrium now, right? So there's a question of okay, I, there's an attachment, right? Of I want to still be able to have, for example, wine at dinner, right? So there's this sort of desire, uh, and and there's a sense of uh, an attachment to that outcome. There's an attachment to that outcome, right? Now. In terms of um, in terms of mind training, there are things I think that can be done. Sure, for example, being very mindful of the environment, avoiding situations that might be particularly triggering. Um, but by and large, it's an uphill battle because what you're dealing with is a physiological situation. There are many lamas who have physical symptoms physiological imbalances and it's, they have great mind training but it's again the situation there is the um, the karma could be a physical situation you know and that and, and and so there's only so much you can do sometimes with your karma I mean that's one of the fascinating things is we do have control of our experience for the most part what we're experiencing has come from past, I mean, according to karma theory, has come from past lives. And we can, ex we can control our destiny, but we also have to work within the confines of our current karma. Is this making sense? And so recognition, part of mind training is recognition of that too, of this is, is this my karma? I mean, to what extent do I accept this? To what extent can I make aspirations and, and to, to move further from this situation. Um, there are things that people can, there, there, there's lots of kind of guidelines around karma. Like if you're having a certain experience karmically, there's, there's many um, amazing kind of instructions on, okay, well then do this. Dzongkhapa's commentary of the Abhidharma is amazing. His fourth chapter on karma, you know, he lays out amazing detail. Okay, if you're experiencing poverty or if you're experiencing sickness or, this is because of this. This is because of this karma. And so this is what would be helpful for purifying the karma. Um, Padma Sambhava said, if you want to know what's, what, what you did in your past, look at your current situation. If you want to know what's going to happen for you in the future, look at your current situation. What are you doing? You know? um, and so, so really, if I would relate to it as a physiological situation. And in, to some degree, you might have the karma to not be vulnerable to that physiological situation but you also might be and it doesn't mean that your mind training is weak it means that the karma is of that physiological situation is very strong this is making sense um so my beef with 12 step, 12 step it says but don't try don't don't but don't well, push it's an abstinence it. only model it's right steps. it's an abstinence only model period don't try, trust the millions of people who have gotten sober in the, in the past that, <coughs> excuse me, if you go out and you try to, to use or enjoy something. Don't experiment. Don't, don't, don't even Don't do experiment. That. If you were, no, if you didn't consider yourself to be an alcoholic, 
yet you were addicted to to a drug don't drink even though you didn't find yourself abusing that because you're going to and it's going to lead you back to right back to where you were and therefore your life blows up again Understanding of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous is that it goes through and say it identifies: Are you truly an alcoholic of this variety? And it goes through three different models, and it says it'll work for this, which is the fifth, not for the other four. Like, so it's not. And then at some other point, it says um, we don't have any monopoly. So it's saying this is a model, and I think it's like the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha saying, you know, there are many paths. So it's sort of looking in our own minds. Are we, you know? So I know that even even the lack of treatments I had in the nineteen thirties for alcoholism at the time when that and then the options were a, a psych institution, or asylum, or the street. That was it. And even then, they said we don't have exclusive. This is not exclusive, you know. And here today, we've got so many modalities all around us to choose from. In San Francisco, it's a dime a dozen. Well, I, <laughs> you is know, it different? So, but it, yeah. So I think you really need to investigate what it actually says. If you go back to the source and see what it actually says, there, I, it doesn't it doesn't claim that this is for everybody. Well, it's, the fellowship is so large. There's so many mm. different varieties within the fellowship. I mean, there are people who. Um, individual people in AA who are much more open to different approaches and there are individual people in AA who are very rigid. So it's really difficult when we talk about AA to talk about it as a monolithic entity. What's really interesting about AA is that there's nothing wrong with that. That's right. Nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's like also reminds me of a sangha when he said, uh, rely on the teaching, not just the personality, the teacher. You know, rely on the on the definitive meeting, not the uh, not sort of the popular culture part of the meeting. Get down to the, the root of of it. Um, it's the four reliances. You know, rely on your wisdom mind, not on your judgmental mind. Um, the I think my sense is. Maybe there was some, for you, maybe the friction has to do with feeling that if someone's in the fellowship, they're going to judge another person who's not necessarily doing what, doing AA or something. That there's a sense of maybe uh, more of a social situation, that this, it's kind of a social stigma or social kind of judgment around it. Uh, if you're not doing AA and you, and you identify yourself as having an addiction issue. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing that I think is definitely true, regardless of the recovery program, is whatever recovery one engages in, whether it's AA, harm reduction, rational recovery, um, their own spiritual path, mm-hmm. whether it's Christianity, Buddhism, it's um, a question of deeply developing compassion for yourself first, really deeply um, sim- having a sympathy for your situation and really feeling interested in others, interested in others, interested in, in connection, whether it doesn't mean you have to be a social butterfly, but it means having enough of an ability to sympathize with your own situation that you are then begin empathizing with others too. And there's a more of a relational situation of compassion, clarity, and um, curiosity. Uh, Those are three things that I think are really key to any healing process. Now, some people do better when it's a very structured program around developing those qualities in relation to the drug, right? It's like, look here, you know, let's talk about 
this process of this journey of healing in relation to the this problem right so it's very explicit something like aa is very explicit in in wanting to organize the healing process around this this kind of reference point of the drug in buddhism you know we organize the reference point of the journey around this notion of self-grasping right as the basis that it, that there's kind of the the other paths don't unfold unless we have real clarity around um how we have self-grasping how self-grasping works right so it's just a question of reference point the reference point of AA could be this basis of the abstinence from the drug. Um, I'm not familiar enough with Christianity, but I'm assuming it would have to, something to do with uh, taking refuge with Christ, you know, and having that being the reference point that you don't, you know, you don't really begin as a Christian until you've, you know, completely take refuge in Christ. So, regardless, you know, I think I think. The journey is involves that piece around curiosity, compassion, and clarity with oneself. And those are things that we generally don't have. I mean, for think about curiosity, right? Um, when we have these knee-jerk responses to things, we are not curious about our reactions. We are not curious about our reactions. We're not. We, you know... We see that person, that family member or something, you know, that always angers us. There's really a lack of curiosity in what, what the hell is going on here? You know, why do I, why do I want to kill, I end up wanting to kill this person every time, you know? Um, Your addiction rests relatively with you know, the Buddhist um, organization. Which so I think is the Sanchala. <laughs> That's what Sanchala is. <laughs> I don't, in particular, do you mean like, like clinical addiction issues, or I mean, like, like for instance, like in, in, in Catholicism, there is there is a big problem with um, like many alcoholic priests, um, and that was an issue that actually had to be dealt with at a at an organizational level. And I was wondering if there's a new structure that hasn't been like that. Well, I mean, you know, it's cultural bound. I mean, when you go in one culture one drug will be much more prominent than another culture. Um, you know, in uh, China, gambling is a major issue. Gambling, much more ga addiction to gambling, for example. If you go down to the Bay Area casinos here, it'll be, you, you, you'll, you know, you'll see so many more Asians. Then it's a culturally bound, addiction is a, that's why I said biopsychosocial. There's the biology, which we've touched on, the psychology, which we've touched on. There's a social element that's massive. I mean, that's why you can have something like in England, you know, very common prescription to, of heroin for many different ailments. And there wasn't addiction like we see it. Because it, the, the social component of it, of it being related to as a, um, a, as a basic situation of, wanting to check out it just was not it wasn't it wasn't in it was maybe people were want were checking out in other ways the socially accept you know the social kind of phenomenon it was not being used in that way it just it was basically like why do we have more gambling among asians you know because it's a, maybe there's components of stigma components of in muslim countries alcohol would be completely much more stigmatizing here more alcoholism, because it's it begins with that piece around it, it's more socially acceptable, you know. So there's a so 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 that social piece, and you know, one of my one of the famous one of my famous um, uh, my favorite uh, quotations in psychology is social oppression precedes psychic repression, meaning before there's that psychic repression of whatever it happens to be, there's a social dynamic first. First, you're getting a message socially around this is something for me to repress. So, um, 
so this the fact that Buddhists came from Asia, you know, for the most part, Buddhism came from Asia, right? It's really recent in this country. So you're going, you're you're taking a, you're taking a whole paradigm, and, and culture, coming from a very different. So it wouldn't necessarily be fair to say, oh, because they're Buddhists, there's not many alcoholics, because alcoholism was not really the, the the same phenomenon as it was in Ireland, where you had Catholics and and you know. Um, <laughs> alcohol is the drug of choice in Australia, right? Yeah. I came from the mid, uh, I, I did a two year internship in the Midwest in Missouri, and it was phenomenal because, uh, it was actually horrible, but it was a, it was a phenomenon that, that I experienced that around alcohol over there is is like cannabis here. You know, in San Francisco, cannabis use is very high, and it's um, and and there in Missouri, it's much more much lower. And you know, you see these manifestations. DUIs are much more common. It's almost a rite of passage in college to get a DUI. You know. Um, so, I think then the, the, we were we were talking about just the sort of the basic situation around relating to the self from that point of view of going beyond the reaction of the self grasping. Um, the um, I'm trying to think of the Tibetan word. Um, uh, there's a there's a there's a is it dark zin? It's this basic. The term has to do with not attachment but reaction. When we think about attachment, the actual Tibetan term that I'm thinking of, <clears throat> but I can't. I'm, I I want to say dark zin, but I'm not wanting to. I'm not confident that that's it. But it has to do with relating to the situation from one of a reaction not not attachment that re, that that in addition to atta attachment you know we have aggression and we have um, ignorance so there, those can all be put under this umbrella of reaction there's a maybe a reaction to just implode inward and want to disappear want to check out there might be the angry reaction to things there might be the attached reaction to things um, and so the, the the term actually in translation with the, we have the famous there's a famous thing around uh, this teacher Tilopa who said you know it's not appearances that bind you it's it's your and then the traditionally it was at your attachment to them and that got tra retranslated as it's your reaction to them so that's kind of where this word was coming into my mind so it's not appearances that bind you it's your reaction to them okay and the uh, and the reaction is an, a, a entrenched sense of self that we're coming from. You know, we react because there's a me that's somehow, you know, being either assaulted or is being feeling lack. You know, I'm feeling lack. I'm feeling lonely. There's a basic sense of I'm not okay. And there's a me there that's really entrenched, a sense of self that is involved in grasping of, of, in a, in, a, in a reactive way. When you say reactive way, are you talking about attachment, aversion, or neutral? Yeah. Okay. Those are styles. In fact, um, one of the most popular books in psychology is by Karen Hornine. She wrote uh, Our Inner Conflicts. And her teacher at the time was in New York, was uh, uh, D.T. Suzuki, Zen teacher and she actually wrote a book she doesn't say this but I believe she based it very much on the three poisons of attachment aggression and ignorance because in the book she says our personalities are either moving towards moving against or moving away moving away is are you familiar with that book or it's you're, you're nodding because the, the concept yeah so she actually became quite famous Go, doing a riff on the, the three poisons, mm -hmm. moving against being the aggressive style, you know, um, 
moving towards being the attachment style and then moving away being the ignorance style you know and uh so these are just fundamental reactive processes um Pema Chodron talks about this reactive dynamic. She says about the four R's, okay? The four R's are recognize. It's got to begin with recognition of what's, what am, what's going on. So that's the curiosity piece. When we don't have curiosity, we're not going to recognize the pattern. We're just going to be engaged in the pattern. The second R is relax. <laughs> so that's sympathy. You're showing kindness towards yourself. You're not recognizing, oh, there I do it again. You begin beating yourself up, right? Because that's another thing you're doing, right? That's another pattern of beating yourself up. So it's saying, no, recognize that too, right? The third R is refrain. And she likens it like an itch. There's the itch. Recognize the itch. Relax. Refrain from itching. She, in fact, at one point said, this is what distinguishes, this is what for me is, is that I consider the, the characteristic feature of my teachers as opposed to how I experience mm, the general ex humanity. The only difference is my teachers don't itch. You know. So... Recognize, relax, refrain, and then the fourth R is repeat, okay? Because you have this long habit of doing something, so maybe you, you actually do the right thing. You got to repeat that. To include the how in there? The how to the refrain? The how to refrain? That has to do with recognizing when you understand the pattern it's like if you knew how you went wrong, then you know how to get back on the road. If you don't know how you went wrong, then you can't really figure out the antidote. That's why when we think about like the, the Four Noble Truths, just by understanding the first truth, the rest come out. If you truly understand what, is, what does it mean by suffering? What is the meaning of dukkha? What, is, what does that mean? Understanding that truly will reveal the source, the possibility, and the path towards that possibility. The Four Noble Truths. So that's, the, again, the idea. When you recognize where did we go wrong, how did we go wrong? So that's recognized. My, the first R might be the might be the biggest challenge, you know. Clarity, you know, I talked about clarity, curiosity, and compassion. So the so clarity and curiosity gives us that recognition of understanding the pattern. Then compassion allows us to relax. Right. Um, when you talk about refrain, how I would also say aspiration. I, I'm a big believer in aspiration, you know making the aspiration. Because if we have any idea of karma, if we believe in karma, then we also then understand the power of aspiration. Intent. And, and if you're not able to, at the time, to aspire to, to make the aspiration. Because what you're doing with aspiration is you're setting a momentum karmically. One of, the, one of the biggest differences, psychologically speaking, from Eastern, philosophy, uh, Eastern psychology and Western psychology is in Eastern psychology, there's, no, um, there's nowhere you can hide. Even your thoughts are rel you know, ha come back. Whereas in Western psychology, there's this idea of, you know, as long as you're not saying it or doing it, it's okay, you know. So, um, so that so that piece around um, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> the four R's. 
Aspiration, right, exactly, aspiration. So that's right. That's the power of aspiration. We don't really learn about that in the West too much, aspirations. I mean, we talk about prayer, but it's really a situation of making it into a practice of asp aspiration. You know. Um, the last piece, I think, in the in this is recognition not of the not only of the reaction at that point because when we get deeper and deeper into the recognition recognizing the pattern recognizing how the self is grasping how how the self grasping occurs we talked about when we know how did we go wrong we can kind of then that's sort of that also will reveal the path out and that uh, comes down to fundamentally recognizing the nature of mind because the nature of mind is the um, the organizing principle is the basis for um, it's a it's a um, sort of a situation like when you recognize awareness when you have a connection and understand the nature of awareness then understand how awareness is not a solid thing is not a individual thing is not a unchanging because when we experience it ourselves like me we experience it as a unity you know and we experience ourselves as enduring when we're not we're constantly changing um so by anyway, understanding the emptiness uh or the, the the way that our own uh, our own experience of this sense of self is dependently arising like a uh like a rainbow that there are these factors that are coming together. And this experience of me is a dependent arising like a rainbow. It seems a few things happen. One thing that happens is the point of reference shifts. The, ex the more we acclimate ourselves and habituate ourselves to experiencing ourselves as we are, the nature of mind, which is empty and aware and all pervasive then there's a you know like those pictures where there's like a woman and then if you look at it it turns into a butterfly it's like if you have a figure ground shift where that sense of self is me as this like individual enduring unity shifts to me as basically um, not not singular but dependent and aware and open and compassionate. Um, oh, there's a no. So, so that's that's where the meditation comes in. Meditation practice is for that purpose of recognizing the nature of mind, recognizing the emptiness of the self as not being this thing that we think it is. That's, and that's the other thing going back to what we were talking about earlier, that small shift. Because the shift is one of recognizing the colored uh, rope as not being a snake. So initially, there's lots of skillful means in calming ourselves down around the snake by calling the Humane Society and getting a net and doing a lot of things to calm ourselves down around this you know, suffering that's happening. And the various 230 forms of therapy out there um, are great for that. But meditation is not therapy, okay? Meditation does not involve testimony. Meditation, if for the purpose of recognizing your nature, is uh, recognizing the snake as not ever having even been there. There is no... Mm, skillful there's no kind of um, investment in, in trying to get the snake out it's a question of completely shifting the whole thing one of going from testimony to one of no longer testimony but a, but a kind of a, uh, the, the problem isn't even there anymore it's a, it's a sky flower it doesn't exist the, the problem of getting the snake out of the room never existed Okay, so this 
uh, enduring situation of our lives since beginningless time <laughs> becomes recognized as having been a problem that we were trying to solve like a problem that we were trying to solve in a dream. You wake up from the dream and it's not a problem. The problem, when you wake up from the dream, then the problem you were having in the dream, let's say of getting out of a cave, is no longer a problem. It's a very, very radical, profound alternative to what we're talking about. Because what we're talking about can be approached from the point of view of psychology, and it has m benefits, but limited benefits. And the limited benefit is that you're still dealing with self-grasping. The only thing I believe that will actually remedy self-grasping is the sitting practice of meditation. Because there, the only practice there is you're cutting the storyline. You've got the story, and you're cutting the story. No other activity do we really do that with. Um, it's really in the practice of mindfulness that we are cutting the story. We still have the experience. We have the, you know, we, there might be risings of sadness, for example. I, I recommend to my patients, stay with the experience, drop the storyline. The narrative is obviously necessary. We wouldn't be able to live without narrative. If I, you know, you and I have a relationship now and it has to do with tonight and when I see you, if I see you again, there's a, there is a narrative. That's why I said there's a difference between sense of self and self-grasping. If you don't have a sense of self and the narrative's all over the place, well, you're psychotic, okay? But if you are able to remedy the ability to not follow the narrative, if you're able to cut the, the story and just be with the experience without identifying it as being me that's having this issue, that's kind of the new situation of relaxing, recognizing and relaxing and refraining, not itching, because the itching is the story. You know, you're still engaged in the story there. It's like adding, and as one meditation teacher of mine said, if you want something to die, don't feed it. So, and then also, um, like with Shanti Deva, where he said, and I'll end with this, and we can ask can, any final questions, that if uh, you want to get across a thorny landscape, you can either put leather on the landscape or you can put leather on your feet. When you put leather on your feet, there's no, it's much less effortful to put le leather over the landscape, putting leather over an entire rocky, thorny field. That's like meditation. Meditation, the sitting practice of meditation, allows one to then cut through the, um, the, um, the noise and the confusion very directly because you're not, you're not trying to find yourself, you're not trying to solve the problem through more narrative. It's a, it's a, it's a very powerful, I would say even backdoor approach to undermining the suffering. So I think the most important thing is to engage in the sitting practice of meditation and to recognize one's nature. So I'm on that. <laughs> so then we were talking about um, addiction, uh, which I, I guess similar to attachment, I think we were saying. Extreme, extreme attachment. Yeah, extreme yeah. attachment. Which I think at some point or other we all have kind of extreme, right? Attachment. And then. Um, and I would say reaction too. I think addiction is aggressive towards oneself. So it's a reaction beyond attachment. It's an aggressive act, it's an attached act, and it's an ignorant act. So it's a reaction. Okay, okay. Um, so then you were saying that one of the, um, I guess, ways of overcoming would be the meditation. Uh, to get away from the self-grasping. Mm -hmm. But could you make the connection then between the self-grasping and the extreme attachment addiction and, I guess, self-aggression? That well, that's sort of the... That's where the um, idea of the narrative, you know, the storyline. You see, it's, it sounds very innocuous in here when I talk about story the storyline. 
but it's extremely powerful. You know, if we really want to get in touch with our stories, they rule our lives. They rule our sense of self, how we experience ourselves. They rule how we experience others. They are, they, they're, they're the basis of our expectations. So the idea of meditation and cutting the story is the practice of not, um, not kind of continually fortifying this, this concrete sense of ourselves, you know. So it loosens it up. It loosens up that whole, that whole kind of concrete way of going about things because you're cutting the story. You're not feeding the story, you know, so it's not getting stronger. What's left is awareness because when you cut the story, because we engage in the story because it's what we identify as us. We're not used to cutting the story. A lot of patients come to me, many people, they've never cut the story, you know, and so the practice of meditation cuts the story. It's a very unique and novel activity. Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche talks about the embarrassment of, embar of meditating in the, in the beginning part, how, how it's actually quite embarrassing to begin because you're almost, you're almost acknowledging, you know, that you have it asked backwards and you've had it asked backwards for a long time. It's a quite a, you know, humble place to start. Yeah. It seems though that some people are, are uh, so obsessed with the story. Because you know you do meet people and they'll tell you their story. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm just giving maybe a bad example, but mm -hmm. I have known people who are extreme, mm -hmm. and it seems it's like this story. And I mean, I've had friends where I s I've said, you know, you got to tell a different story because I'm kind of getting bored with that story of yours. Tell the same story all the time. That's exactly but, why they do it. Right. So, but you're saying, I mean, it sounds simple. It's it is simple. Remember that thing or I was saying about the spark the plug? Yeah, the spark plug is simple. It's it's a very deep problem. <laughs> it's simple. Huh? No, it's just a spark plug. <laughs> they repeat that's why they do it. They, re they it's they it the because it's boring is why they do it. The nervous system is used to familiarity. The, your nervous system is not used to novelty. So even if you want to make a change that's for the better, logically, your nervous system is not on board. Your nervous system wants you to do what's familiar. So that's why they engage in this story ad nauseum, because it is familiar. And our nervous system is happy with that. Which is why, again, when we talk about meditation, we're talking about not just, you know, a cognitive thinking thing, but our whole being. There might be this experience of discomfort, you know, around not engaging in the story. But again, there's a there's a the practice of being with that, of not reacting to that either. You know, the whole thing is actually difficult to talk about because physiology and thoughts, they're all mixed together. You know, it's 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 there are two thing there are two ways of seeing the same thing. So I think one of the things that you were saying at the beginning was that um, the addictive, let's say, personality. The or profile. Whatnot, the, yeah, yeah. The profile mm -hmm. is that of a person who doesn't have much of an inner core. Yeah. And therefore, I would imagine it'd be very difficult for a person like that to sit and meditate and and try to get away from the narrative when there's not that much, maybe. There is, oh, there is narrative for them. Yeah, no, there isn't a narrative, but I'm saying once you go past that narrative, where do you go inside if you've never had that kind of because they have Buddha you know, nature love and security and yes, because they have Buddha nature, mm -hmm. that the the Buddha nature is is there, and you could ha I mean there, the sutras are there, I the, you know there's a sutra where there's a person who's a mass murderer, and he's killed 999 people or something recognizes Buddha nature, okay, and then becomes a Buddha. So that, that example speaks to regardless of the circumstance, we have Buddha nature, and it's a question of recognizing the Buddha nature, the awareness aspect of our mind, okay, because that part is always there. Like a glass of water, you know, you put debris in the water, 
and you stir the water, it becomes muddy. But if you don't stir the water, the water becomes clear on its own. You don't have to put detergent in the water. The nature of the water is to be clear. The nature of our mind is to be completely wide open, aware, without reference point, and completely perfect. What was the guy's name? What was the mass murderer that died? Amago Juli? Milrapa's one of them, that's right. I was thinking of the sutra. Um, yeah. Ala Magduli, Amagduli. Amagduli. Yeah. Yeah. You recognize that one. Yeah. 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 So that's again, he had Buddha nature, you know? Any more questions? Yeah. Thank you. I gave a weekend teaching on a Saturday on a text, a 19th century text, and then that's the point. Parent or not? Ten of children. I talk about we should talk about the four R's. Recognize, relax, and that's what I mean. I was. I don't. I don't. I didn't mention them. I didn't mention them. Well, no. Do you have the pamphlet? So don't buy the pamphlet. That's an audio CD. You can buy that. It's from Sound School, I believe. You can if you just googled it. Um, Ten of children don't bite the hook. Don't bite the hook. Oh, is it an actual? Uh, it's not a text. It's not a text. No, it's an audio. Which I don't have anymore. I said one of my patients borrowed it years ago. Uh, last week. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, no, it's just a little